So uh, good, e good evening and welcome everyone to uh, a new edition of our uh, Philosophical Cafe. Today we're gonna speak about uh, Ioan Petru Culianu and his book, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance. Our speakers are uh, Dana Jalobanu and Doina Cristina Rusu. And I think it would be best to begin by asking our spe speakers what magic meant in the Renaissance, and also maybe uh, some words about the historiography of magic. Dana, would you like to begin? Oh, yes. Well, that's, that's a very complicated question. Let me give you a very simple answer to that. Um, let's say that that magic is simply the um, practical part of wisdom. It's the practical part of wisdom and it has a very long tradition um, going perhaps as far as antiquity. And um, the ideal of a magician is the Persian Magi, you know, the, the Persian Magus, who already features in Plato's Alcibiade as the uh, example of perfect wisdom, a wisdom that covers natural philosophy, political philosophy, theoretical aspects of wisdom, and practical aspects of wisdom. Uh, the Magi being someone, being um, a group of philosophers who have power to understand the world, but also to change the world. I think that in Renaissance, in the Renaissance, there is a strong revival of this ideal. But then when we look at particular figures and works of magic in the Renaissance, the way they do understand this ideal can differ very much. On the, and, and here I'm just drawing too big, uh, I, I'm drawing a very, a very uh, sketchy and probably caricatural picture by saying, let's imagine that there are two big groups of philosophers engaged with magic in the Renaissance. On the one hand, there are, there is the Ficinian magic that those like Ficino and Pico, who, for whom philosophy is a technique or a, a discipline of um, bettering humankind, of becoming uh, more like angel, angels, more like stars, transforming humankind uh, in, in, in a good way, becoming more like angels, more like stars, less like animals and demons and magic is part of this exercise. So magic is understood in strong connection with the sort of astrology, which has this image of a human being, a fluid uh, character that can evolve or can uh, go backwards and involve. This is one group. And there is another group of people involved with magic and here I would quote uh, Giovanni Battista della Porta later on, or I don't know, Cornelius Agrippa. This group is closer to what we would call today applied science or technology. They're more interested in changing the world, understanding the world and changing the world than in understanding the human being and changing the human being. So that would be my very rough definition. I'm sure that Doya can take it as a sort of an accurate picture. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, Kuhn connected in the meantime. Hi, Kuhn. So, um, yes, I, I do agree with Dana's distinction. However, I think for most of the people in the second group, knowledge of human nature is still maybe the most relevant part of being able to manipulate nature. So I think that part isn't lost. Um, and we will see this especially with Kulian. Um, a little bit about the historiography because Grigore um, 
ask this. So why do we have today this idea that magic is just an uninteresting occult discipline? Um, and, and this has to do with um, the idea of a diff two worldviews, the pre-scientific one, and that's the magical worldview, and the scientific one as being completely different. Um, and we know that lately people started to recover this um, tradition and see a continuity between uh, magic and natural sciences. Uh, there is still this question of what exactly happened in the 17th century. And um, there is an article by John Henry, which I like very much because I think uh, it's very well argued that um, we still consider that magic is precisely that part that was lost and maybe still exists in the idea of witchcraft, while other parts of magic, like the manipulation of nature, but also not only this more methodological part, but also some of the ontology behind still existed in the 17th century, but in natural um, philosophy. And we can already see this distinction before, because a lot of the authors that we are going to mention today made a distinction between natural and demonic magic. And in a way, it is mostly that demonic magic that became witchcraft and is what nowadays we understand by magic, like in common language and the um, natural magic, which is really knowledge of nature and manipulation of nature based on that knowledge continued in um, natural sciences. Um, when we are going to move to Kulian, we are going to see that he places himself a bit in between uh, these camps of the one of discontinuity and the one of continuity. Um, and he has a bit of a different distinction between two kinds of uh, magic. But I'm not sure we want to already move to Culliano. Let's state what is the Culliano thesis on magic and the origins of modern science. So I would say that what he's doing in um, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, at some point, he makes a distinction that I found it very important. He talks about democratic and intersubjective magic. And the democratic magic is, he considers that technology keeps that dimension of magic. And there is a direct continuation between magic and technology. And he gives as examples uh, the plane. And this idea of flying was something that the magician was promising to people, also communication at the distance. Also, our conference today on Zoom would be for Culliano really a, this kind of democratic magic because we all have access to it. Intersubjective magic is something different. And that has to do with um, manipulating um, the imagination and we are going to talk a lot about this. What I would like to say now is that he sees an indirect continuation between this kind of magic and some disciplines that only appeared in the 20th century, end of 19, sociology, psychology, applied psychosociology, psychoanalysis. And the reason for this temporary disappearance in principle are the reformation and counter-reformation and what he calls the censoring of imagination. So he considers that this part of magic disappeared for a while and only lately has been revived um, in these disciplines. So in this sense, he see a discontinuity. That's why I said that he's in between the two. Um, thesis about the relation between magic and science, and he sees this discontinuity differently than um, someone like, for instance, sorry, discontinuity, no, uh, discontinuity, it's different from someone like 
John Henry or those people saying, well, kind of the, the leftovers of magic um, still constitute a discipline that is not scientific and uh, has nothing to do with science nowadays. And that's why magic has this bad name. Uh, but part of this for Kulianu would be actually recovered. Dana wants to say something. I, I wanted to add something or, or make the picture a bit more general here um, by saying that today our, I mean, magic for us today, it's a very weird, strange sidetrack subject. Um, for the Renaissance and early modern philosophy, magic is everywhere. So again, if magic is nothing else but the practical part of wisdom, or as the Porta or Reagan defines it, the practical part of natural philosophy, then you would expect a lot of people to do magic. And that's exactly what happens. So I think it's important to maybe emphasize for those who are not Renaissance scholars or early modern scholars, but I do, but I do watch us and listen to us tonight, that with very few exceptions, most Renaissance philosophers and quite a few of early modern philosophers were doing magic as well as other disciplines. Um, and I said Francis Bacon, I said already Marci da Ficino, and I said Giovanni Battista della Porta, but there are others. Uh, and again, there are few exceptions of people who didn't like magic for religious purposes and say, said so. Other than that, magic was quite a central enterprise. It was the practical part of natural philosophy. Natural magic yeah, was the practical part of natural philosophy. What uh, Kuliano says in this book, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, which has today already, has, has already 30 years, it's already 30 years old. old. Um, what Kuliano draws our attention to in this book is that not only magic, that is not only that magic was an important part of Renaissance culture, and that we should look more carefully to a bunch of sciences or practical enterprises or theoretical enterprises that have something to do with what he calls magic, but he wants to throw us as a challenge the question whether this magic, Renaissance magic, has completely disappeared or whether we can find it today under different forms. As Doina said, under, for example, the form of, uh, the form of some sort of social psychology uh, or various arts that are supposed to manipulate us in one way or another, or in the form of technical uh, successes or successes of technology like Zoom tonight. Are we now, in a way, fulfilling the ideal of 13, 14, 15, 16th century magicians who want to communicate at a distance, or are we doing something completely different? That's one of the challenges in Eros and Magic in the Renaissance. Is the Kuliano thesis on the origins of modern science a variation of the Merton thesis? A, re a refinement of the Merton thesis? What do you think? So the Merton thesis being the idea that um, the emergence of modern world begins with Protestantism or a form of Protestantism that the Protestant Reformation, a special branch of the Protestant Reformation that Martin calls Puritanism, that happens in England, uh, is either solely or majorly responsible for the emergence of modern world. This was very popular at the time when Kulianu wrote the book. Uh, this is a book written in 87? 84. 84. 84, sorry. Uh, uh, in the 90s, we have a, a book edited by Ivy Cohen called The Merton Thesis Revisited. So where a lot of uh, historians of science are rethinking and criticizing 
Milton thesis. But again, uh, in, in the 80s, that was still popular, I think, to think in terms of uh, the Protestant Reformation who did something to the early modern uh, society, for example, some sort of censorship or some sort of uh, uh, moving the accent from one way of, of uh, doing philosophy, for example, doing philosophy around images and using emblems to another way of doing philosophy, for example, the Cartesian way of doing philosophy with mathematics and formulas. And yes, Culliano is um, saying something very similar. He's saying that um, the whole way of thinking about knowledge has changed somewhere uh, around mid 16th century, the beginning of 17th century, and has changed because of social pressure, political pressure and religious pressure imposed on um, those who are doing the thinking. And he calls this the censorship of the imagination. Maybe we should talk more about this. Uh, I think Dan has a comment on this. Dan? Let me turn on my microphone. Um, I read Juliano just a little bit differently. I was really quite struck by the last chapter and the example of the wingless fly. And um, certainly the Reformation is very, very important. Um, but I think the Reformation and the emergence of modern science in Culiano are the result of um, the same underlying cause, which is the change in what Foucault would have called the episteme. You know, giving up the idea of um, a world that is sort of infused with imagination um, in favor of, well, he doesn't really say what the new scientific spirit is. But um, it looked to me very much like Foucault or even like um, a Kuhnian scientific revolution. Although Foucault is only mentioned once quite briefly in the, um, in the book and uh, Kuhn is not mentioned at all so far as I can see. But there's also that evolutionary aspect that um, modern science and by that he means experimental science, Kuliano. Um, um, is able to emerge when the um, environment changes in such a way as to make its survival um, possible and to, in a certain way, undermine the worldview that made Renaissance magic possible. That's in any case the way in which I read what it is that um, he's proposing. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, um, indeed, he doesn't mention Foucault much in Eros and Magic, but I was reading these days another book by him, Yokare Serio, and he makes a lot of references to Foucault there and the entire analogy and uh, signatura rerum stuff, so the entire second book of, of Le Mans et les Chaux. So, yes. Yeah, I'm um, not surprised. But he does mention in Eros and Magic, and he's uh, kind of declaring himself um, as working within that framework is Feyerabend. So the the beginning of the in the beginning of the book, he is almost declaring himself a disciple disciple of Feyerabend, of the method everything goes and you know, extreme tolerance with respect to ideas, extreme tolerance with respect to frames of the world. He talks about frames of the world. And uh, and to him, history evolves just by changing a frame of the world with another frame of the world. That's also very 1970s, 1980s. Yeah. But what is not, uh, I think, so much uh, situated in, in the immediate uh, philosophy of science that Kulian was writing I was contemporary with, is his proposal to look at magic as a historiographic category. 
Uh, and I think, I mean, to me, that's the most important part, I think, of the book. It's not necessarily the main message, maybe, of the book. Uh, and I don't think that the, if the main message of the book is that of the censorship of the imagination in the strong sense, in the, in the either Foucault sense or, or Kuhnian change of paradigm sense, then I think that's probably wrong. On the other hand, what I think it's very interesting uh, in the book is that Culliano is really giving us a very interesting thing to think of, namely that uh, maybe we shouldn't look at magic from the perspective of actors' category, at categories, because uh, the magicians of the Renaissance or philosophers of the Renaissance who declare themselves to be interested in magic and who did magic, did very different things. Um, but maybe it's interesting to look at them with the lenses of this new historiographic category called magic. And for magic, he has a very, very large, all-encompassing definition. Magic, he says, is a way to manipulate the contents of the imaginary. Now, that's, of course, something extremely, I mean, everything is magic. Yeah? If, if the idea is that I manipulate my, my imagination, and maybe with the help of Zoom, some of your imagination, um, Acting can come in, uh, literature, poetry is doing this. Um, all sorts of other things are about manipulating imagination. And not any kind of uh, manipulation, but since the book is called Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, uh, the manipulation that has something to do with the passions. And he proposed us to look when we look at Renaissance magic and we want to do a history of Renaissance magic, to look for people doing this, namely manipulating the contents of their own imagination and the contents of others' imaginations, be them individual subjects or masses. And the result of this challenge is that he is able to put together books that were not necessarily put together or read together by historians of Renaissance magic or early modern magic, like V.P. Walker or Paolo Rossi or uh, Francis Yates. And I think that this proposal is extremely rich even today and maybe actual as a because today, you know, in the past 10 years, we are all searching for new historiographic categories that will help us better lenses, yeah? Better lenses to look at the past. So this is a very interesting lens, the lens of magic. Uh, and that's, that's what I really like about Kuliano's book today. Do you think that this concept of magic captures uh, what is, for instance, De La Porta doing? Um, the Laporta is not a character for, for Culliano. He's mentioned only two times in the... Exactly. In the and that's maybe a question for specialists in the Laporta here. Um, Culliano takes his... So the, the, main, the main character of Culliano's book is Giordano Bruno. But the definition of magic that Bruno... Um, Bruno's definition of magic, it's not necessarily as large as, as Culliano's. So I think that Culliano's definition of magic fits the best Ficino, because Culliano was a specialist in Ficino. And he took his, uh, his, his Ficinian framework and put it on Bruno and created something very general. Now, whether this fits someone like De La Porta, I don't know. Um, La Porta basically was not a magician in this sense, I think. I don't know. What do you think, Doina? I think that in a way we can we can see the Laporta in this framework. So I think there are several definitions of magic in Culliano. So we have a very general one in which magic is a phantasmatic process that 
makes use of the continuity between uh, individual pneuma and the universal pneuma. And this, in fact, continues even for those people who don't have this universal pneuma or a world uh, soul spirit as Ficino. Um, and then erotic magic would be one part of this. Um, and indeed, so he mentions um, Bruno here because of the vinculis and because for Bruno, all the affections and passions can be reduced to love. Um, there is a really nice quotation from uh, Bruno where he explains how everything can be um, reduced to love. So uh, for instance, uh, envy is because of self-love and so on. And Bruno says that the strongest chain is the chain of Venus. But that doesn't mean that other people don't have this conception. And Culiano is mentioning, for instance, in the case of Ficino, the idea of the harmony of the universe and the idea of sympathy and antipathy and love and strife, all these things which are already ancient ideas and which we do find. I mean, sympathy and antipathy play a very important role in someone like De La Porta. But indeed, Culiano is more interested in that kind of magic, which is intersubjective. And what he means by intersubjective is that both the manipulator and the manipulated have imagination. He says there is also an extra subjective magic, and that's when the manipulated entity doesn't have an imagination. So might still have a spirit, because for most of these people, there were spirits in everything. But it's not the same um, relation because it's not a communication between two imaginations. You can't create really a, um, an image in a stone, but you can still manipulate it. Well, with a stone is difficult, um, but let's say a plant. I think if Sergius would like to intervene about De La Porta and his idea of, of um, theater in, in the natural magic, I think that's precisely working on the imagination of the reader. Um, we have two people in the chat claiming it does not fit. Dan and Joe Hedeshan. Dan, please. Um, no, I will, I will pass it over to Joe. Um. Okay. Um, well, I mean, it seems uh, it's it's kind of related to uh, what Duena was saying that uh, basically, uh, if you act on an imagination, then it's uh, I mean it's a psychological definition of magic. So uh, it presupposes that you um, you have an imagination. So it is about human beings rather than. The material world, unless of course you uh, you assume that the material world somehow has this kind of imagination as well, uh, and it depends on how far you want to go with this. And of course, uh, people during that period would say the pneuma of the uh, human beings is the same as the pneuma of the uh, of the world. So there is a communication going on throughout the world. Uh, which is something that uh, is definitely not common today. So the, this kind of definition seems better fitting to uh, the magic categories that are uh, used today. Let's say what, what we think magic is today. Yes, but so what about chapters two and three of the Magia Naturalis? where he describes all kinds of monsters, um, either animals or plants, and the famous plants that are half something and half something else, or that you have a chestnut in a plum, um, and all these kind of things, which for them he claims, for all of them almost, I think, that he performed them. So he really joined a human being with a horse and with a monkey and so on. Um, isn't in this case his aim to inflate the imagination of the reader? 
So <laughs> what did you think we see the subject, not the animals or the plants that he's talking about, but the reader of the book? Well, I mean, it's, uh, I think it goes into issues about transplantation and whether that actually, I mean, they thought it would work or they thought that it was um, only, a, like you say, manipulation of the mind of the reader. Um, but it seems this is kind of difficult to say. I mean, because again, now going back to Culliano, he would say that we don't quite understand what we, uh, what this, let's say, De La Porta might have meant. Uh, and that we kind of uh, assume that maybe he meant to, to manipulate the mind of the reader, but maybe he actually thought that this was possible. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Well, I think that that's, that's exactly why. So there, there was a question. Maybe Sorana wants to ask her a question because Sorana asked a question in the chat, but maybe that should be voiced. Uh, Sorana, would you please state your question? Uh... Yes, thank you. Um, th this is going away from De La Porta and the question of natural magic and whether it fits Culliano's bill. Um, back to what Dana was saying about um, the um, what, what, what you, Dana, were, were saying was the interesting thing about um, Culliano's proposal at a historiographic level, that magic, as he describes it, as the manipulation of imaginations could become, could be seen as a historiographic uh, category. And I, uh, um, I, my question was, uh, what would be the gain of, um, the historiographic gain of uh, putting up magic as such a category? Um, um, since, as you said, if you see magic that way, uh, many things would come under this category, from ancient rhetoric to uh, contemporary, um, I don't know, um, media, social media manipulation or whatever. Um, I, 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 would, I should think that this all-inclusive category would um, undermine or would come against the grain of what Culliano tried to do, which was to account for what in his mind was a dramatic moment or reversal uh, that introduced the modern world, the modern scientific spirit. So uh, what he tried to do, um, not very successfully to, to my mind, is to um, account for this his historical shift towards the um, modern uh, um, scientific spirit uh, mind or type of uh, thinking um, w with reference to what was lost and what was lost is this precisely this um, uh, science of the mad art of the imaginary so um, uh, hence my question if if you see magic as this histori historiographic category um, presumably uh, capable of doing um, epistemic work outside the uh, moment that Culliano wants to explain, then what would be the gain? Um, yes, well, precisely uh, the fact that you can um, discuss texts or authors that were never discussed together, together, or put apart texts and authors that were put together traditionally and you put them apart. So what we are looking for in history and philosophy of science nowadays are historiographic categories that can help us understand better um, the division of disciplines or the divisions of or the or the questions that in our mind are are wide apart but in in the actor's mind are together or new historiographic categories can help us uh, see connections between texts or authors that that were not before that moment connected. So I think that, that if we look at magic as a historiographic category, it does precisely this. And let me just bring De La Porta back into the discussion because it's a very good example. So De La Porta claims he's doing magic. Um, now, if we, if, if we read uh, this in a very strict sense, natural magic as in the second edition of De La Porta, which was more like technology, um, 
then it doesn't look very much like magic and it doesn't look very much like uh, Virginian magic or Brunian magic. But if we look through the lens of Kuliano's magic, namely that magic is a manipulation of emblems and a manipulation of the imagination, then there is a lot of this in uh, the Laportas Magia Naturalis, as Doina pointed out, either at the level of um, modifying uh, the uh, borders between species or at the meta level of a theater of imagination. The book is a theater of imagination that acts upon the reader. And it works with the same emblems and the same contents that other um, Renaissance, let's say, magicians, okay, philosophers interested in magic are doing. Uh, to me, the main um, interesting discovery in doing, in looking at, at this uh, Kulianus historiographic category was to realize fantastic similarities between Bruno and Bacon um, that, that I haven't noticed before, I didn't bother to look at before, but with this historiographic category, they suddenly become obvious. Look, there are these two authors who actually lived in the same city and kind of streets apart for a couple of years. And they're both using these emblems for the same things. Uh, shouldn't this be inquired into more carefully? Well, maybe, maybe it should, okay? So at this level, I'm saying that um, magic as a historiographic category can be very useful as all the new historiographic categories that historians of science are putting on the table now and then to help us understand better what we are reading. Ariana has a comment. Ariana, please. Uh, thanks, but there are more comments before me. I just, I just wanted to, to bring in modernity because if we are speaking of modern science, now it's generally agreed upon that you cannot place the beginning of modern science in the Renaissance or even in the early modern period, not as such, but rather in the 19th century, of course, in a long period. And I think in the 19th century, also the, the um, opposition between occult sciences and science was thought again. And I think this is very much in Culliano. And this I thought reading him. And when Dana proposed her definition, I was thinking, well, but that would, as I wrote, perfectly fit all these uh, things like movies and theater, opera, all the ways to uh, even politically manipulate the national, the, the, the representation of the nation in many ways, which were typical of the 19th century, which and people who have studied media theories, film theories, who have studied this 19th century um, manifestations, always point back to the Renaissance, especially to De La Porta, a lot to Kirchner. So, and they say, oh yeah, so in that sense, this would, I think, well fit what, what Diana and Dorna were arguing, that you can, you can project that back, that this category can be useful also to understand the Renaissance. But to me, one would have to explicitly consider the, um, the role of modernity and how these categories that we, that Culliano, in my opinion, was using for the Renaissance are also a product of the process which uh, determined modern science in the 19th century. I don't know if I'm express myself somehow clearly. I'm bringing in another epoch. I know this is maybe not the best way to <laughs> help the discussion. Thanks. Uh, Joe Hedeshan and then Kuhn have some follow-ups. Joe? Uh, yes. Um, no, I, I, was, I was just reflecting on the, uh, whether this uh, historiographical dialogue that uh, Dana is mentioning, I mean, does it extend to, um, yeah, to putting in dialogue, as Culliano actually does, uh, Renaissance biomagic and modern uh, psychosociology, as he calls it, or psychology? Um, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting that he calls this magic, and uh, I think this is somehow one of the most controversial parts of the book. 
I mean, can you actually call modern psychology magic? And I mean, is it useful to call it magic? Um, I've, I've actually gone through about eight or nine reviews of, of Culliano's work and almost all of them had this to, to comment. I mean, basically that he uh, uses presentist, a presentist position. I mean, he actually starts by saying, oh, psychology is magic and then projecting it back in, onto the Renaissance. Um, and I don't know to what extent anyone has actually gone through and uh, analyzed this claim of his and whether it's, uh, it's useful to do that or should we uh, drop that, that level of dialogue across, across historical periods uh, as being irrelevant. Uh, Kuhn, do you want to add something? Well, let me first just add something to your point, um, because I think it's interesting. Well, I think it's interesting that Culliano connects the, the psychological part with the magic. While I think in historiography, what we've seen is that uh, psychoanalysis and these kind of categories have mostly been used to understand witchcraft, um, which is exactly the opposite of what uh, Culliano understands with magic. And so, I mean, there is an interesting interplay there. And, and uh, in that sense, maybe it's a corrective to use psychological categories also for these other uh, practices. Um, but my, my question is more, and well, I really don't have the answer. And, and I hope some of you may have the answer if, if some of you have looked a bit more broadly in, in Colliano's work. And maybe, I don't know if he has work in Romanian that are not accessible to, to me. And, and I haven't read much more than than the book, but I'm, I'm really wondering, I mean, since, I mean, you and others have been saying like he's using presentist categories, he's looking, I mean, he's commenting on the present quite a bit through his historical work. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, do people have insights? And so please, <laughs> I mean, if, if people have a response uh, to that uh, on, on what he actually wanted to achieve with the book. Dan wants to add something at this point. Dan, please. Actually, not exactly on this point, because I'm, you know, I find it, um, I, the book is most, I mean, to, to address Kuhn's point, I think the book is mostly focused on characterizing um, a certain conception of magic, uh, rather than on, I mean, the, the stuff about the transition to modern science and the connections with things like social psychology, psychoanalysis, and so on, seem to be relatively brief add-ons at the end. But one of the big differences, one of the reasons why it is that I find the connection with sort of the contemporary social sciences and psychological sciences um, a little bit problematic is because one of the really interesting things I think about Culliano's conception of magic, I agree with Donna that one of the really interesting things about it is that it brings together a lot of different domains that appear to be quite separate. There is magic, there is witchcraft, there is um, the memory, you know, the, 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 the works on memory uh, the works on politics and so on are all brought together under this idea of influence, influencing the world by affecting the imagination, which is, I think, a marvelous way to bring all of these things together. I don't know whether it counts as an actor's category, but they're obviously, but Culliano, I think, is obviously gesturing at um, a way of looking at the world that he's trying to characterize that brings all of these different things together. And he's calling it, and he's calling it magic. Um, I think though, and this in a certain way addresses what Doina said about, you know, imagination and the rock um, a little bit earlier. It is, I think, for Culliano predicated on a worldview in which there are sympathies and connections, not only between one human being and another human being, but between 
human beings and nature as a whole. And there is a certain kind of what he calls, I think, a pneumatic magic that, that connects all of these things together. And even though to a certain extent, the idea of a science of changing other people's imagination and acting on the world through imagination is connected with the contemporary psychological and social sciences. Um, that other dimension, which is, I think, really, really important to Culliano's conception of the Renaissance episteme, to use Foucault's term, um, is, is something that is missing in contemporary social science. Yes. Uh, Dana or Doina. What kind of book is this, Dana? Is it a scholarly book? Is it a political commentary, as Kuhn says in the chat? What kind of book is this? Um, it's very difficult to say. I would, ex I would describe it as engaged history or engaged history of science. Uh, there are some books like this. The people who really want to change the present and our way of of thinking by appealing to our history. Um, and I think that, Kuyan, that uh, it, to reply to Kuhn's um, question, I think that that's roughly speaking the ambition of the book. Um, it's not so much a scholarly, it's not a scholarly book in many ways. And it actually, many of the bad reviews that it got from the experts is because it's not scholarly enough. It's a book with a very wide appeal to the public. I mean, we are still talking about it 30 years after. People are still reading it. Students are still discovering it. It's still in print, as opposed to many other books, you know, like the fantastic book of Paolo Rossi, which is very difficult to find. Francis Bacon, From Magic to Science. It was a fantastic book, but it has been out of print for years. Or Francis Yates or other books. But maybe Francis Yates is in the same category with Kulian. Um, so I think it's it's uh, it's more than a it's not really a scholarly book. It's clearly not a book for the experts. It's not a book for the historians of the Renaissance. Um, that's one point. The second point is why is it engaged? Well, here we should perhaps talk a bit about Kulian. Um, Kulian, I think, really believed that the magical sciences of the Renaissance the art of memory, magic, Ficinian magic, erotic magic, intersubjective magic, captured something about human relations and human beings, something that was partially lost. Now, uh, to make it a bit more general than he did it, let me just put it this way. Um, it's what was lost was our capacity of being creators of powerful images. Um, images and emblems that can direct, teach, uh, help us discover, pose problems, um, help ourselves in our, in our uh, investigations of nature or in our investigations of ourselves. Think at Plato's dialogues. Socrates is a big creator of images. Um, and Culliano seems to be very unhappy that from a certain point onwards, philosophy and science have lost this capacity of creating powerful images. The second point of the book, namely that there are some agencies around or some uh, psychosociology that does this today, that still has the power of creating images, I think is not entirely true. Um, and I, I would separate, therefore, two points, uh, two main points, or the main two points of the book for me, namely that there are, there are these creators of images in the history of human thought, 
And at some point, the capacity of being creators of images has been either lost from science completely and it moved into literature, let's say, or has been partially lost. And yes, there is a kind of criticism of, of the current world in which we are not creators of images anymore, but we are consumers of images. Something has happened to human imagination, at least in general, I mean, the human imagination at, at, the, at the basic level, at people who are not necessarily philosophers or scientists, but maybe something has happened also to the imaginations of philosophers and scientists, namely, they're not creators of images anymore. They are consuming images. They are, re they are playing with images that are already there. And I think Kulyanu, here is the uh, kind of the hidden agenda of the book. Kulyanu believed that, that uh, there is a way of recovering this uh, capacity of the human imagination to create powerful images, to impress the others. And I think that throughout his works, uh, there is something about his big dream of recovering some of this power of, uh, of creating images, of impressing others, of writing in such a way or teaching in such a way that he uh, manipulates other people's imagination. Maybe, I don't know, Dan, you have met Kulianu, you have heard about Kulianu's teaching at the University of Chicago. Some people are saying that he really believed in magic and he was really teaching magic as something that was working at least upon his students' imagination. Do you have any recollections of this? Um, actually, no, I don't, because I actually, um, I am now sorry that I never went to um, uh, any of his classes. I had just, I met him um, about a week and a half before um, he was murdered. Um, at a reception, and we had actually um, planned to get together a few days after he was murdered, and um, so I never got to actually talk with him about about these things. I had read the book um, at that point, and I must admit I I wasn't sure what to make of it, but um, um, no, I'm afraid that that. Uh, I missed, I missed, we all missed a great opportunity to actually listen to him. I went and I, I, I tried to find lectures of his on YouTube and I was not able to do that. I think that there aren't any. Uh, but then you taught at the University of Chicago. What could be the position of the university uh, with Kuliano teaching students divination through cards, for instance. In relation to what? Uh, divination through cards. To divinate the future through cards. What was the position of the university on this? Um, to the best of my knowledge, the university didn't have a position. He was teaching in the divinity school at the University of Chicago. He was a, uh, uh, of course, the reason why he went to Chicago was because Eliada was there. And um, that's, that, that's what attracted him there. That's I'm sure why it is that he went there. And the Divinity School at the University of Chicago is a very interesting and unusual place. I was never actually a member of the Divinity School, but I um, had a lot of friends there, um, gave lectures, in the Divinity School. Um, it was a sort of um, um, very broad, humanistic, historical, open-minded conception of religion in the broadest sense. And so he was officially, I guess, brought as a historian of religion although this book is certainly a lot broader than that. Um, and they, the university was, I think, very pleased um, um, to have him. The day that he was murdered, um, there was scheduled a meeting of the faculty senate 
And um, I was a member of the faculty senate at that point and uh, was walking past the divinity school to uh, the meeting. Uh, and I met the president of the university, Hannah Gray, who is also a Renaissance scholar, uh, coming the other direction, which was strange since she was supposed to chair the meeting. So I asked her what was, what was going on, why she was going in the other direction. It, when she informed me of that, the university shut down that afternoon. Um, it was, it was a, a, a tremendously shocking event. He was, um, I think, very much valued um, by the university. There was, the work was unusual. The work was obviously controversial, um, but it was, also, it was also the sort of thing that I think was appreciated very much. Somebody who was a genuinely original and innovative um, scholar was very much appreciated. Um, even if his work was a little bit um, um, out of the ordinary. I would like to mention here an uh, idea that Dana told me, namely that he's using these emblems in his own book. So for instance, the wingless fly is just one sort of emblem. Dana, would you like to say more on this? It's, you told me this and I... So, so what you are what you are saying, Grigora, is that this book has a meta level, uh, and at the meta level, Kulianu is playing his uh, theory of magic upon us, the readers, uh, explaining at the same time how this works. So, what are we what are we today? We are consumers of images. We look at commercials. We are manipulated by movies. Nowadays, when we read, um, God forbid, but I, I'm afraid that if students read today Homer, they would think of Achilles with the face of Brad Pitt. Um, and, you know, there's my, my famous example of a, a small village in Scotland that erected a statue of Braveheart with Mel Gibson's face. I think that this is what Kulian is saying when he's talking about the censorship of the imagination that we are somehow now in thrall of uh, images created by others and we are not able to produce our own images. And we can look at this book as a book that is serving us <laughs> some images like the, like the wingless fly. But it's also explaining to us how a creator of images like Bruno was doing um, what was doing his tricks uh, and what does it take to be a creator of image, images as opposed to be a consumer of images. So that, that was my point that, or, or rather my question, whether this book, whether the success of this book, the fact that this book survived, uh, it still has some appeal. Uh, it's not due to this kind of meta level reading in which Kulianu is, um, is playing a bit of magic upon us. I we have a whole discussion going on in the chat. Uh, for instance, Kuhn claims that magic works. Uh, Kuhn, would you like to uh, say something about uh, what you wrote here? Well, if you define magic as manipulating the imagination of someone else, I mean, it's clearly working. I mean, it's what we started with, like even the Zoom session today is Dana is manipulating our imagination. So I don't think that's very controversial. Um, it depends on how you define magic, right? And if you follow Kuliano's definition, I think, I mean, as you have been saying yourself, I mean, he's he's manipulating our imagination through his book and so forth. So there's many, many levels to that. Uh, Joe, would you like to add something? Uh, please turn up your microphone. Turn, turn on. Yes. Um, my point was that uh, Bruno, I mean, actually uh, also 
uh, divided between, let's say, creators of images and consumers of images uh, in relation to Dana's point. Uh, I mean, he was, I think he was perfectly happy uh, that uh, some people are just, uh, you know, gobbling up uh, images. Um, and I, I think that was his main, uh, the main role of the, the vinculis was to, to show the knowers how to manipulate and create consumers. So in some way, uh, I mean, I, I think, I think the point, uh, I mean, I might be wrong that Donna is making is that um, uh, we are less creators than consumers, but uh, I think Kulian would say that uh, the people that manipulate, uh, like the magician state or the um, the media gurus or what, whatever, they are creator of images. So they, they are in a sense magicians. I mean, they, they he calls them magicians. So they would be creators, not consumers. Dana, would you like to reply? Uh, the only thing I, I, I've been thinking of this, and of course, uh, at the first, at the first uh, sight, it looks like there are people who are creating images today. Yeah? They create commercials and we go by it. But my point was that somehow these images are recirculating old images. Just think how many, um, the, the, you know, there is a trend in the past 20 years when you look at movies. Hollywood movies, for example, they are in ma ma major part of Hollywood movies are remakes. They are recirculating old stories. They are recirculating old images. Um, and, and in this sense, I was saying that even people playing with images today and manipulating others with those images do not create them in the sense in which uh, Ficino or Bruno or Bacon uh, were creating them. Of course, there is a sense in which Renaissance philosophers were also remakers of ancient images. They were taking Plato and uh, Plato's dialogues, and they were taking, I don't know, Ovid's metamorphosis, and they were giving a twist on that and so on. But since no visual representation was sometimes involved, but merely uh, representations in words, those were still had something, uh, had some, some, some different kinds of appeal and power that uh, the mere commercial today. So here I see a big difference between um, using uh, emblems in the way in which Bruno did and using a movie today to convince us, to persuade us to buy a new brand of coffee or something like this. Uh, and so maybe we should bring to the surface the discussion on the yeah. Uh, Sorana has a comment to the point. Please. Yeah. Um, I suppose what I was uh, saying was something you also implied, but not entirely, because you're saying they were recirculating things in the Renaissance at the level of texts. And I would say, no, they were recirculating a lot of visual uh, stuff uh, in their images. Uh, they were. Um, um, you know, uh, making the kind of collage of uh, ancient images that is very much um, um, part of the techniques of, um, of image makers today. So what is the difference exactly? I, I don't think that the, well, um, I don't suppose you wanna say originality is what, um, is at stake because I don't think you want to say that originality is a Renaissance value, um, and um, isn't it perhaps rather as Culliano seems to continuously um, suggest? Although he doesn't make of it the main point of what he's saying, but it looks like it is the main point. It's that these images are used for a spiritual purpose. He's, he's giving us the Neoplatonic framework. He's telling us that those images uh, help with the ascent of the soul, with the discipline of the mind, uh, when he brings in the Stoic connection as well. Um, so is this the difference at the level of what to do with those images rather than what they are? 
Absolutely. So I think that the main major difference is that um, in creating an image with words, uh, even if that image is a recirculation of an old emblem or fable, even if that image is something that has been represented, you know, Botticelli's Venus or whatever, uh, described by Ficino with words in order to create a talisman, uh, that gives you a problem. It gives you something to think of. Um, a commercial is not, is not giving you a, but, but a problem. Dana, here's where, where things I think no longer add up in Culliano's account. Um, those images are not supposed to give you food for thought. They are supposed to manipulate you in the Renaissance as today. So he wants to, to put these two things together. And I wonder how that works. The spiritual, the noble usage of the images and the, excuse me, and the thesis about the manipulation. Right. Yes, but let, let me give you a simple example. There are manipulations and manipulations. Mm. Uh, you can tell uh, your child a story and uh, the story has characters and you can describe characters with your own words and you can describe them very, very accurately. And the child still has a lot of room for thought. Um, I was shocked when my little niece knew perfectly well how the little siren looked like from, from the movies and she didn't accept any addition to the fact that the little siren has to have blonde hair and a green something and some green stuff here and there. And there was nothing to add to that. Uh, and th th there was no question about how do you think this character looks like? anymore. So I think that even if, I mean, literature is manipulating us. You, in, you, you, you think manipulating us in this way, not in the way in which commercials are manipulating us. You think children were more reflective in the Renaissance? No, we're more imaginative. Okay. Children are less I imaginative. Very much. <laughs> I think that Laura Giorgio wanted to, to comment on uh, this. Laura? Uh, please turn up your microphone. Turn on your microphone. Uh, Laura, I'm afraid you didn't turn on your microphone. Yes. Yeah. No. no, I think it's okay. Well, uh, I was just commenting on uh, other people's uh, ideas. Uh, but I would say that uh, images today are uh, just abused very rare uh, creators of images here here i uh, i su uh, support dana uh, come with something new in order to give us food for thought usually people don't need food for food for thought they just need images to consume their time and uh, i would say that uh, not just most of uh, of media but even most of uh, scientific work is just to be done, not to, to give us food for thought. So yes, I, I fully agree what Dana said. While in a Renaissance, I'm afraid that people do not need to create that much. Therefore, they simply created. They simply did it without being asked for. Now we are asked, we are looking for creation, and therefore much of what we create is just superficial. That was my point. Uh, I think Kuhn wants to bring in the Jesuits. Kuhn, would you like to read what uh, you wrote in the chat? Um, sure. I mean, yeah, I just proposed in the chat that I think um, the Jesuits are, I mean, at least in, in my view, a weakness in Culliano's argument because I think the way they they have used images and imagination is, is quite stunning. And uh, I don't see a reason of separating that from what he writes about the magicians in, in certain ways. And of course, I mean, depending on how you look at these traditions. Um, yeah, yeah, I know the Jesuits were like the same as the Puritans, but I mean, I, I think there's good reason to, to look at what they have been doing. It's very skilled in manipulating people's imaginations and passions. So that, that would be my point. Um, 
in in the sense of the earlier discussion, what I would say is that I'm 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 not sure if we're if we're trying to make too much of the Renaissance magicians. Um, I don't think they should give food for thought or anything. I mean, they the point is to the the best ways to to bind the passions and to manipulate the imagination of others and. It doesn't need to be the most complex or the most uh, rich image. I mean, sometimes very simple means work the best. That would be my point. What is actually this censorship of imagination? Mitchell Yade in the preface compares it with the iconoclastic crisis in the Byzantium. But if we look, for instance, at Descartes, what would be the censorship uh, of imagination in his work? A lot has been uh, written on the role of imagination in Descartes and the Jesuits and others. Dana, what would you say on this? I would say that it's not, it's not um, uh, working in the case of Descartes. So it, on, if you look at the, the kind of small scale history, uh, Quirianus thesis doesn't work. It's not as if 18th century suddenly didn't exercise imagination anymore. But I think if you look on the long scale, and that's that's another characteristic of these kinds of his this kind of history. So if you look at you know today or after 19th century, maybe Ariana had a, a point that we should return to there. Uh, and in comparison with the 16th century, then then you quite see the differences. Uh, that the contents of theories were very different ones. Uh, theories are formula driven, for example, in science. They are not image driven anymore. They are not experiment driven. They are formula driven in many sciences. And we, uh, if you look at philosophy and uh, the language of uh, 19th and 20th century philosophy, you see that there is a case that 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 you might kind of you, you can construct an argument for Kuliana's thesis of um, the fact that we are working with different kinds of contents than the contents of the imagination. Um, and also, if you look at the kind of images, as my I was trying to give some examples here, as the kind of images that the emblems were images created with words, even if they had a visual support, they had a lot of words. And images today where uh, what you have as primarily and in a way univocally given to you is the visual image and words are just, you know, they don't, they don't belong to that image in the same way, then you can see the differences. But I don't think you see the differences in the way in which Kuliano would have liked to see them, like, you know, once Descartes started doing analytic geometry he lost the capacity of exercising his or other people's imagination. I don't think that that's true. I think we lost Doina, right? Uh, but Joe has a comment. Joe, please. Right, sorry. Um... So my, my point was uh, in, in direction with Kuhn's point, um, and it was about uh, the Jesuits. I mean, the, my, my point was that um, uh, Culiano is, is referring to, uh, I mean, he's making this structuralist argument about Puritanism, and somehow this doesn't quite fit the historical data. And I think that that's somehow the main problem of his argument is that this structuralist uh, point of view doesn't quite quite nail it down the, the historical uh, historical um, aspects. I mean, he, his main point is that uh, that religion censored uh, the imagination. So any kind of uh, religious perspective, in some way, is sus susp suspicious to him. Uh, as being, you know, part of this counter-reformation or the Puritan movement, as he calls it in, in general, uh, since he doesn't refer to Puritans as, you know, what we call Puritans in history, but as a kind of um, a historical uh, structure that is referring to, uh, the, to the censorship of imagination or to the 
um, uh, you know, to to going back to the biblical account and the words of the Bible. Kuhn? Yeah, I mean, I I had that question in the chat before, but I'm I'm, I'm I mean, I guess the thing I'm struggling most with is is maybe this question, like how to work with this kind of book. I mean, we said it's not literally like it. Well, it, it doesn't fit the historical data necessarily. It's it's an engaged history. So how do we? And also going back to to Dana's point, like well, how how and Sarana's point, how, how can this be kind of an inspiration for a new historiography? Um, if we're doing scholarship, so that I, I guess that's my the question I'm struggling with. Well, one way of replying to this is to say that uh, history as non-engaged history, the ideal of objective historian is. Uh, Weberian concept is a 20th century concept. If you read, I don't know, Bacon on history, for example, um, if you read Gibbons on the history of Roman Empire, you have engaged history, history done with a purpose and done through the lenses of the present. So it's not a new concept at all. It's it's the way historians of the past have done, well, some at least, maybe there are there were always more than one trend, but there is one trend in which you are searching the past in order to find answers to the, to the present. So maybe that's how you relate to it, by putting it into the same camp with those who are doing history of the past with the purpose of changing the present. Um, and again, Gibbon's book on the history of the Roman Empire is what comes to my mind, but maybe Burkhardt on the Renaissance also has something to do about this. And there are others as well. So it's just another, we, we have to take into account the fact that this is engaged history and then treat it uh, as such. Well, I think, and just to reply, Dana, I think that's fine. And I think, I mean, of course, I can read it that way. And I appreciate the book that way. The question is more like, how how can we use it in our scholarship? Like, as you said, like, well, it, it can inspire us for a new historiography, maybe. That means that we would apply it in our own work. And I'm, I mean, we can also start writing engaged history. And I'm, I'm not even against that. But if we if we would like to use it in our scholarly work, how would that work? by not taking everything that Kulianu says at the face value, because again, um, the book has in a way many aspects. One aspect is this aspect of recovering some lost aspects of magic, as Doina was saying in her, uh, in her review on the blog, uh, that other historians of magic didn't necessarily look for. Another purpose of the book is to argue for the censorship of the imagination. And yet another purpose of the book is to look for continuations of uh, sciences of imagination today. So you don't have to take the whole package. What, what I would take and what I think is important and, and relevant today is to see whether this concept of historiographic concept of magic is not useful for our own purposes. That doesn't mean that I'm doing engaged history or that I'm uh, taking Kulianu you know, as, a, as a master. I'm just looking for uh, another historiographic concept, another pair of lenses with which I can study the past, which can be used interchangeably with other pairs of lenses and you know, being aware of the fact that this is a fallible pair of lenses. Uh, it is also the case that with his unconventional ideas, he discovered the uh, text which is now taken seriously by the conventional scholarship, namely De Vinculis of Bruno, which was not so well known before him. Uh, but Dan had a comment here. Dan, please. Uh, turn up your, on your Oops, microphone. I'm sorry. I actually had a couple of comments. Um, one was just simply that um, Engaged history is a sort of political argument. And in this respect, it does seem to me that Culliano is very much in the spirit of Foucault. 
Um, and as Joe suggested, Fire Amend as well was definitely um, probably more engaged than a historian, but certainly, you know, whose philosophy of science was intended to be um, understood within a political context. But the other question that I raised in, in a comment a few moments ago was, um, you know, all of our discussion has been about magic, his conception of magic, and the um, um, relation to the imagination and shaping the imagination, um, which is certainly central theme um, in the book. But the title is Eros and Magic. And he emphasizes a number of times the connection between magic and Eros. And I'm wondering what the Eros adds to um, the discussion of magic that we haven't been um, uh, concentrating on? Well, unfortunately, we have lost Doina, who would have had an answer to this. Um, yes, Kuhn, maybe you want to take it over. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't. I wouldn't say I have the answer, but as far as I see it, Eros is is desire for Culliano, and uh, that's the whole core of the whole thing. That's how you create a bond. That is how you manipulate an imagination. An imagination is is triggered by a desire. Um, so that that would be my brief response. That it's it's really it's the same thing. I mean, it's so interconnected that I'm I'm not sure how to separate it. So imagination and eros are for Culliano the same thing? Well, eros and desire, and I think Im imagination would would be um, is is the kind of thing that um, well, I mean, traditionally both of his, of, of 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 course, passion and imagination are closely connected, but I think for for Culliano very strongly so. Um, and I think in both ways, I mean, the des desire. Uh, basically binds the imagination, but also the other way around. Imagination also uh, influences desire, obviously. Well, but more than that, I, I, I would say that the idea of a vinculum, the idea of imagination creating links and connections with people. And Donna, the way in which you presented it before, it is a question of simply the power of imagination. But I think, I think for Culliano, one might say, it's a power to do what? It's a power to build connections between people. And if we're talking about what it is that's lost in moving from the Renaissance um, episteme, again, to use Foucault's word, to the um, um, modern scientific conception as Culliano is characterizing it, that may be something important that's lost. The eros part of the, the desire that builds the vinculum, the links, which is again, something that he emphasizes, I think in his reading of Bruno. I think yeah. Joe wants to add something. Well, I, I think there were, uh... okay, so, um... I think I was trying to make two points here. Um, for one, it seems to me that uh, when when he actually goes into a lot of discussion, I mean a d deeper discussion, it seems like he makes, I mean, Culliano makes a connection between eros and this whole idea of universal attraction or universal sympathy. This this uh, whole idea of uh, you know things. Um, attracting and repelling each other, which is, of course, the, the basis of most, uh, or if not all, of natural magic during this period. Um, but uh, my question uh, slash comment was that, uh, uh, I mean, he somehow also kind of tries to, um, you know, to have more exciting, uh, I mean, to, to go for the excitement for, uh, let's say things that are catchy, 
um, and uh, in this relation, uh, I, uh, I I found really funny um, Charles Webster's review, uh, who was actually criticizing uh, uh, criticizing Fuliano for you know uh, associating the amount of female flesh uh, with with the index of emancipation. Uh, I mean, he actually says uh, equally unfortunate and somewhat distasteful are uh, Puliano's remarks concerning attitudes towards women. Uh, and he adds that readers will object to Puliano's use of the amount of female flesh exposed in the fashions of the period as an index of em emancipation. Uh, and it seems to me that what Charles is implying there is that uh, he, he's going for the shock value for, um, and he's also using kind of a presentist viewpoint from, from uh, let's say, 1960s counterculture that kind of emphasizes this kind of, uh, you know, uh, emancipation of women as being, you know, let, let's say, more sexy or more, you know, uh, you know all this flower power, uh, um, you know, let, let's say, all, the, all this movement towards uh, nature and the nudism and this kind of thing. And, and he's kind of accusing Culiano again of, of using presentist categories and putting them onto the past. Let me try to defend Culiano here, if I may. Please. Uh, Culiano did his, I mean, he was a specialist in Ficino, don't forget that. He did his first uh, dissertation on Ficino and kept working on Ficino. Now, Ficino has this fantastic commentary on Plato's symposium. Um, don't forget that Eros is the, way, the, the other way of knowledge. There are two ways of reaching the world of ideas, uh, two pairs of wings that we can develop for Plato. One is mathematics and the other one is love. And uh, for Ficino, Eros is really uh, a mean to better uh, ourselves, the kind of humanity that we can develop. So Ficino's human being is, is something that can very easily develop into something more beautiful and more closer to stars or angels, or can decay into something closer to animals or demons and so on. And Eros is the main uh, is, is a pair of wings that the soul can develop in order to, to ascend. So I took Eros and magic to be a kind of a reference to Ficinian uh, erotic magic, basically to Ficinian philosophy that somehow was, was kind of creeping into Kulianu's more general um, uh, theory. There might be a bit of what, what Joe and you know, quoting Charles Webster are, are saying, because clearly the book uh, was written with, a, with an eye on how to make it more attractive. But if I would like to, to defend Culiano, I would say that there is a way in which Ficinian magic um, is very much within the tradition of the platonic love as an instrument of knowledge, as an instrument of modifying the soul, like substantially modifying the soul, to help it ascend towards the world of ideas. Uh, Dan, do you want to I'm, say Yeah, something? can I make just a brief comment? Um, I think I didn't read it quite the same way that Joe read it as, as an attempt to sort of um, make an impression, say something um, um, shocking that would gain his attention. I think it's it's an expression of um, a pre-feminist conception of the um, role of women and the role of eroticism. It's all written from the point of view of um, uh, male. And um, I think it's just simply an expression of what Culiano's culture was. Uh, Sorana, do you want to add something to this? You wrote uh, in the chat, Ficino plus flower power. Um, yes, um, which seemed to me um, a good 
a good summing up of what had been said before, but that was not my point. Uh, rather, um, I would come back to something I said earlier. Um, since Dana is emphasizing this Pacinian side of things, which is certainly there um, a lot in the book, um, as is the um, stoic um, uh, purification of phantasms, described very nicely, actually. And that, that, that is the scholarly part of the book. Um, the um, description of the Neoplatonic and the Stoic traditions, and that, that that's really um, a, a great read. Uh, still, I think, still today, even at the scholarly level. Um, so, how does that stand? So that is the part where the emphasis is, as you say, Dana, on the ascent of the soul, on the on the clearing of the mirror of of the heart. Beautiful. Um, uh, part of, of that is part of this tradition of, of spiritual exercises, um, of the trajectory that the individual engages in, uh, either by himself or within a small community, of, of um, uh, traveling the path to wisdom. Right? How does that stand with the other emphasis of the book on the strictly manipulative part? You were saying earlier that this, that the manipulation in the Renaissance is not really the gross manipulation of our days, but rather a uh, sort of invitation to reflection. I doubt that. And Kuhn had a comment, and I'm with him. The kind of, but the kind of manipulation that Kulian is talking about is, is manipulation. It's, it's not a way to wisdom. It's, it's uh, operating on others by tapping onto their desires and weaknesses and ignorance. Kulian talks explicitly about that. So, um, how, do, how do they stand together? Facets, excuse me, are these two facets of the same story? Um, or are they distinct stories that uh, do not integrate too well in, in the overall narrative? I think there are facets of the same story. Now, think again of Socrates. Socrates is a manipulator. A really, you can read what Socrates is doing with the poor use of Athens as being gross manipulation for a very good purpose. But the first step, if you, if you think of Plato's dialogue, think of Charmides. Charmides begins with a straightforward lie in which Socrates claims that he has a cure for Charmides' headaches. And in order to cure his headaches, he is going to first engage him into a discussion and then touch his soul and then take him with him, with him, with Socrates in a fantastic journey. Think of Archipiades, you know, there are all sorts of examples in which uh, Platonic dialogues do have this aspect, the aspect that we ascribe, that we put it on the side of the manipulation. Um, I, have a, I have in mind now, I don't remember the quote now, but there is, uh, there is a fantastic recurrent um, thought in Seneca's letters to Lucilius that basically says logic and even rhetoric as understood as, you know, and continuation of logic for the Stoics doesn't do the work that philosophy should do because it cannot change your mind. It cannot transform you. For the inner, inner transformation of the soul, Seneca claims you need stronger um, medicines, stronger instruments. And what are these stronger instruments? And that's the big question for Seneca. What do I have to tell you in order to take you with me in a spiritual journey. In what way do I have to phrase my words? What kind of images I'm supposed to use? This is manipulation. And I think that this is exactly what Ficino does. He is assuming all sorts of literary devices, constructing all sorts of things, interpretations, risky interpretations of Plato. He's constructing it himself as a persona of a master. He's inventing the whole story of Platonic Academy for the purpose of, you know, 
creating disciples, putting together schools. That's what Bacon does he, with his stories of the New Atlantis and so on. There, there's a lot of imagination in there as well. Um, so they, they are not, you know, the, mani the manipulation and the, the rhetoric of the, or the teaching, okay, the lit literature and philosophy, they are not very, it, it's very difficult to draw borders between them. They are not very separated. They're not much separated. So, can I add something? Sure. Uh, yes, the, the way you present them, yes, they are compatible. And, but that's only one facet of the problem of, of uh, manipulation, as you know, um, uh, in, in, in the period. Uh, there's also one, one type of manipulation, one type of conception of manipulation that, that, that's, that does not fit this uh, generous, generous um, um, and nice scenario. And you mentioned Bacon, remember, you recall that, that Bacon, when he talks about the binding of another person's imagination, he says that what works best, the kind of person this works best on are the weak, the ignorant and the fearful not the students of wisdom. Well, I mean, the students of wisdom were at some point weak, ignorant, and fearful. They were not born intelligent and clever. That was not Bacon's meaning. <laughs> I don't think it was. <laughs> Mariana had a comment. Mariana, please. Well, this was just a, a, a side comment on the, on the issue of Eros, because I, uh, I mean, I agree, of course, with with Anna that the, the Platonian, Pichinian um, uh, view of Eros plays a role. But actually, in the Renaissance, uh, the, the say the sexual relationship, gender, and um, well, even the as as I mentioned, the hermaphrodite, they were very important as categories of of knowledge or of practice, uh, like in occult sciences, especially alchemy, but not only there, and from there also in discussions in, in magic treatises. So, so this, I, I have no idea um, whether this played a role for Culliano, because I did not read the book with enough attention. And, um, but this is something which indeed one could see as a clear difference between the, um, the say, magic or philosophy discourse of the Renaissance and what later becomes modern science, because these are, these are not any more categories of knowledge, but they become objects of knowledge. Gender is defined, uh, sexuality is defined. Um, I mean, I, I know this is, there are quite a lot of studies on this subject. So I don't know, I was wondering whether these quite rich uh, aspects of eros and sexuality in the Renaissance, as they were used in, in magic, play a role in for um, for Culliano, or whether he was only focusing more on Piccino or Bruno. I don't know well enough Bruno to know how he stands from that point of view. It's just a question more than a comment. I think that Joe has an answer to this. <laughs> I mean, seems to be in the chat. Uh, well, um, I mean, it's no, it seems to me that um, I was kind of referring to the dis discussion beforehand, I mean, basically about the manipulation. Uh, and the fact that uh, Giuliano actually talks about Bruno as being uh, this kind of immoral, uh, I mean, writing this immoral treatise, uh, which is basically, uh, he says it's more important uh, nowadays uh, in some way than the, the Prince of Machiavelli. And uh, I mean, he's implying somehow that, uh, that Bruno is, um, not necessarily concerned with the, you know, the, you know, helping you achieve the higher self, but rather, um, you know, just being uh, manipulative towards the goals of someone that is, you know, uh, he's writing for. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of a, an interesting point, which which made me think more about, 
um, the fact that he's actually writing it for, uh, let's say, a princely audience or let's say rulers that would manipulate the masses towards some kind of higher philosophical ends. And in, in this sense, maybe there is, a, there is a connection perhaps between his views and those of uh, Plato's Republic. Or, or this idea that you know you um, you know the rulers or or someone important would would be able to decide what is best for the masses and basically manipulate them without them knowing uh, towards this greater goal. And um, I think that's somehow his criticism of the magician state that he makes later is the idea that this magician state by which I think he means uh, the US really, um, is not somehow involved in this, um, in manipulating, I mean, he, they, uh, let's say the Western world is manipulating, but they're not manipulating it for higher ends. They, they don't uh, have this kind of Brunian or Platonic vision of, of where to go with it. I mean, what, what to do with, it, with this uh, science of the imaginary that they've discovered. Um, so uh, perhaps in this sense, this is this somehow his a more subtle point he's trying to make. Um, so yeah, um, for discussion. So. I think that, you know, we assume, you know, in this discussion about manipulation, that you can be free of manipulation, that um, you yourself as a person, I mean, I as a person can somehow develop outside of uh, manipulative influences. And this is, of course, not true for the Renaissance view of a cosmos where everything is interconnected. And also not only interconnected, but very sensitive. So bodies in the Renaissance are very sensitive to external conditions. They're always manipulated by something, whether, you know, heat or light or astral influences or words and songs and music and images. Um, souls are like small, like, like you know, detectors of, of waves, let's say. They're always in motion. Uh, the magic here is a kind of art of uh, giving a, a sense and some sort of direction to all these motions. Uh, in either in, in my interpretation, in a good sense, I mean, trying to raise the soul and so on and so forth, or in the bad sense, if you talk about manipulating masses, or just giving some sort of, or just proving that this is possible. I think a lot about Bruno is just proof that this is something that works. Not necessarily that we have to do it, but here is something that works. If you do this and that, you manipulate all these sympathies and create, uh, aggregate all these forces and the result is a substantial change in matter because you know, spirits are also some, some form of matter. Kuhn, do you want to add something here? Just to, it's the pleasure to contradict Tana, <laughs> so to speak. Um, well, I think Kuliano says that uh, the magician needs to control his own desires and imagination. And in that sense, he would be free of manipulation. And that, that gives him the control of all the others. So, and I think that's, that's a very interesting yeah. point. Yeah, well, so, here is the trick. Here is the tricky point, actually, and that's the next step I wanted to actually introduce into the discussion, because yes, the Br Bruno, uh, actually, and Juliana following Bruno says that uh, you have to manipulate the powers of errors, but you yourself have to be free of the powers of errors, but you have to play as if you're not free. So the magician is a great actor. Uh, and now, if we introduce the term, the, the, the acting category here, we are back to Socrates, who was a great actor, <laughs> wasn't he? So what is this acting? In what way you are at the same time free of desires, but playing as if you do have desires? And uh, I don't know, I have no, I have no answer to that. But again, that, that 
reminds me of the famous scene of the Plato Symposium, where Socrates seemingly tricks Alcibiade in believing that Socrates desires him, and in fact Socrates doesn't, and the whole thing is a very, very interesting theatrical uh, scenario at the end of which we are supposed, well, supposedly Alcibiade learns something. Sorana? The pleasure of contradicting Dana is shared by more than one. <laughs> That's what made our, has made our conversations very sparkling uh, throughout this period. So Dana, isn't it the case that Socrates was not really free of desires, but rather that as he confesses, uh, he knows how to control them. There was actually a story circulating very much in the Renaissance about, um, um, uh, about this, about the fact that uh, you cannot really change your nature. And Socrates is of a passionate nature. He does uh, uh, experience eros, right, towards Alcibiades, but has uh, grown virtues and the virtues have been able to tame, um, or rather keep in check rather than completely destroy his passionate nature. No, I think you're absolutely right. But this is where the acting uh, comes in. So um, the controlling your passions doesn't mean you are transforming yourself into a stone face, um, I don't know, creator of images and, and professors of philosophy. It means it transforms you into a fantastic actor. And in the, I think the same goes for Bruno. And by the way, I think the same goes for Culliano, what Culliano wanted to do perhaps with his students and with his books. Can I, can I raise a question? Can sure. I raise a question here? Um, I'm, I'm actually a little confused. First of all, I do think it's not really possible to be without desires. But if the point of magic is manipulation, and creating vincula among people and between the magician and other people, isn't it necessarily the case? I mean, if the, if the magician did not have any desires, you know, let's leave, leave aside the question, are they erotic or are they not? But if the, if the manipulator did not have any desires, well, why would the magician Enter into the enterprise of um, uh, trying to trying to um, um, shape somebody else's imagination um, <laughs> and build um, vincula between himself and others. No, I, you're absolutely right. Of course, uh, I think the that there is no. I mean, free from desire doesn't mean. Uh, free from desire in our sense. It means someone whose intellect is controlling his passions um, and it's keeping, someone who is keeping himself in check all the time. So the difference is, the difference between the creator of image, the manipulator of image and the consumer of image is that the first knows himself and uh, knows how, how the faculties of his mind work and knows how the universe work. I mean, let's go back to where we started. Magic is supposed to be the practical part of wisdom. It's not, not just a game of, you know, cards or it's not the, uh, the magician is not the counselor of a king that would create uh, um, masses, uh, mass hysteria to do this or that. I mean, not, no, no Renaissance magician would, would agree with this kind of definition. The magician is supposed to be a wise person, namely someone whose intellect is controlling one's passion and keeping imagination in bonds. And the practical part of wisdom was to do something to other imaginations as well, or, you know, to, to modify the world according to wisdom. So in this sense, I would say that uh, when, when, when 
when Bruno talks about manipulation, even if there is uh, this, there is this dimension of the fact that you, you manipulate the weak because it's easier to manipulate the weak than to manipulate other strong minds as yourselves. Uh, you are doing it with the purpose of uh, increasing wisdom and or you know, going towards wisdom and uh, doing something. I mean, that, that, that's what practical part of wisdom means. Is, is, Machiavelli's, is Machiavelli's prince uh, a magician in that sense? I don't know what would be Kulianu's answer to this. I think Joe had at some point something to say about that. Uh, um, well, I mean, certainly he uh, seems like Kulianu was uh, thinking that uh, Bruno's magician was stronger than, than Machiavelli's prince. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my sense was that uh, Machiavelli also wanted to be some kind of magician and uh, the prince uh, well this is this is a big question I mean is the person that um, I mean is is Bruno as a magician giving let's say giving advice to Queen Elizabeth let's say about how to manipulate masses I mean is Elizabeth becoming a magician by the means of his advice or his as a magician, he's manipulating her, but uh, th this is a, uh, yeah, it's, it's a question of, of magic. Um, but my, my, um, my point was, uh, my point was a bit different in that I, I wanted to underline something that um, came, I think came out of the discussion, it, 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 which is that arrows somehow is higher than magic. I mean, it's, it's not the same thing. I mean, uh, it's, it seems to me uh, that what, what comes out of it is that uh, Eros somehow unites with the, let's say, the divinity that's, that's somehow um, the theory. And whether after that you use it to manipulate uh, other people, then that, that's, uh, that's afterwards. Um, I'm trying to make this clearer. Uh, I mean, basically, Eros is more like a mystical experience of, of the divinity in, in the Ficinian sense and in Pico's, especially in Pico's sense. Um, and then the decision that, okay, I'm going to actually use this uh, divine inspiration to um, for the purposes of magic seems to be, to me, that it's, it's a bit different. And it goes back to uh, Dan's point about uh, whether you, I mean whether you want to manipulate or not, and and this goes again goes to the point of desire. I mean, do, do you want to manipulate or you don't want to manipulate? And I, I think Bruno would say that uh, yes. I mean, it's uh, somehow your duty to manipulate in order to make the world better. And I, I think it goes back to this this whole Renaissance magic uh, purpose which is to to uh, improve the world around you so so in that sense manipulation is equal to to the um, to improvement of you know the, the the masses or the people around you i think that's actually machiavelli's um conception of the prince as well that the prince the the prince is doing all of these apparently terrible things to enable um, a stable state um, to persist, which will be to the benefit of the citizens. We are close, uh, slowly approaching to the end. Maybe as a conclusion, our speaker should say what they consider to be the most fruitful part or what remains out of this book. And I would ask then, what do you think is the best part of Kuriano's book? The one that still remains, it's not outdated. You're asking, you're asking me? Yes. <laughs> um, I actually find um, for me, the most interesting and most attractive part 
is the is not the um, engaged historical part, but actually the um, the attempt to sketch a very different way of looking at the world than we look at it now. And um, I appreciate that there are some questions about its historicity, but in a certain sense as, as a literary project, um, I mean, one can do that by writing a novel or perhaps making a, a historical film, but the idea of um, trying to portray what it was like to be somebody like Pacino or somebody like Bruno and the way in which they looked at the world. What I, what I um, for me, the reason why one does intellectual history, history of philosophy, history of science is, for me, it's out of a kind of intellectual tourism the idea of wanting to go back and live and, and experience an exotic culture. And I think that that's for me what, I, what, what it is that I find most interesting about uh, Culliano. It may be in a certain sense a fantasy the way a novel is to the extent that maybe it's not historically completely accurate, but it's still very engaging. And that's, I think, what I take away from the book. Joe, you raised a lot of criticism. Uh, is there something that you liked in this book? No, actually, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I give that impression. Actually, I, I've always loved the book. Um, I mean, it was actually one of the, the readings that uh, were a turning point in my career and made me go into academia and especially to study the Renaissance. Um, and I, I think uh, I mean, it is very, it is actually difficult to to put myself in in my teenage years to to remember, uh, but I thought it was um, a very, you know, um, exciting reading. I mean, it it made an exciting reading about the Renaissance, and and he opened new new ways of thinking about it. Uh, which, of course, when, when you look, you know, you look backwards with the eyes of a scholar that has more experience, maybe you find all these, um, these things that are in inaccurate. But uh, yes, as a, as a reading, um, as an, uh, let's say, an introduction to, to, to the subject of Renaissance magic and to, uh, to excite you about this topic, I think it, it was a very good book. Uh, and I think it still excites people, and that's one of the reasons why it's uh, why it's still being read. Um, and I, I think there are there are definitely other aspects that are exciting, you know. And uh, certainly the the present disposition is, you know, you as a scholar you criticize it, but uh, it also engages your imagination. So. Uh, yeah, I think in a way uh, it is a work of uh, that that. Of magic in the sense that it uh, um, it engages with your imagination and it ma manipulates it towards uh, actually caring about these people like Ficino and Pico and Bruno and and their projects and uh, uh, basically attracts you to try to understand more about the period uh, as, as Dan was saying and to understand what how these people thought and why they were um, you know why they were writing and what they were, their purpose was and the, why uh, magic was so important to the Renaissance. If there aren't uh, any other comments, I will leave to Dana the conclusion. Oh, but I don't know how to draw any conclusion. It was a very interesting discussion, and I think, um, well, in a way, we proved our point. This is uh, an engaging book. It appeals to our imagination. It appeals to our imaginations as students and it drawn some of us into the profession. I think uh, I can say the same as Joe said that it was a turning point in my career and attracted me into the profession a long time ago when I was a student. And I'm very glad that this is still, you know, it's, it's doing the same 
to students today. Um, it's, it's, again, I'm, I'm claiming it's not a scholarly book. We shouldn't take it to be a scholarly book, but it's a, it's a very important book um, for precisely this purpose. And I, as I said at the beginning, uh, rereading it now as from the scholarly perspective, I, I felt challenged by this historiographic concept of magic. And I think that this is uh, useful for the scholar today to read, to reread uh, Renaissance texts with, with a different kind of lenses. Okay, let's thank Dana. We might open the microphone and clap. There is no reason to clap for anything. It was very, it was a very nice discussion that is ending our um, summer, of the philosophy after dark, um, our summer season or whatever, how shall we call it? Second season of philosophy after dark. So I would probably together with Grigore wish everyone a kind of good holiday or good beginning of the year in the case of, of those who are already beginning a new academic year. And maybe we shall see each other again in the fall. See you in September. Thank you very much, Dana. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.